In November 2017, journalist Vanessa Beely gave a groundbreaking presentation to the Swiss Press Club in Geneva on the so-called Syria Civil Defense, better known as the White Helmets, which bills itself as an impartial group of volunteer search and rescue workers working to save lives and strengthen communities in Syria. In her presentation, Beely demonstrated the connections between this supposedly neutral organization, recognized terrorist groups operating in Syria, and the UK government. During my time working in East Aleppo, it was clear that the councils were working hand-in-hand with Nusra Front. Their centres in each district were always next door to Nusra Front headquarters and White Helmet centres, i.e. they always formed an integrated complex. Less than three weeks later, The Guardian released a report painting all skeptics of the White Helmets, including Beely and other anti-imperialist activists, as proponents of a Russian propaganda campaign directed by the Kremlin. This is no coincidence. The White Helmets are in fact part of a coordinated propaganda campaign. But that campaign is not being directed by the Kremlin, but the Western governments which have been responsible for the founding and funding of the White Helmets and the ones promoting that propaganda are not independent journalists like Beely, but establishment mouthpieces like The Guardian. In Syria, they know how to intervene. They know how to manipulate the media. We had the White Helmets, a complete propaganda construct in Syria. They end up getting an Academy Award. They know how to intervene in in public discourse every day, and in politics every day. The White Helmets are a propaganda construct. This is the Corbett Report. And the Oscar goes to... Okay, the White Helmets. It's quite appropriate that a propaganda documentary honoring the work of the White Helmets won an Oscar at the 2017 Academy Awards. This is, after all, an organization that thrives on the magic of movie making to make themselves into heroes. Surely any movie that could turn a group funded by the US and UK governments, associated with Western intelligence operatives, and embedded with Al-Qaeda terrorists into a group of crusading heroes is as worthy of an Academy Award as any similarly fictitious movie about superheroes saving the world. It was also fitting that the leader of the group, Riyad Saleh, was not at the ceremony to help accept the prize as originally planned. Hi, um, it's for NPR. I'm wondering, um, I thought the White Helmets were going to be here, or the leader and the cinematographer who shot a lot of this film. What happened? Well, uh, Riyad Salah, he, who's the leader of the White Helmets, um, he couldn't come in the end because um, the, uh, the last couple of days in Syria, the violence has really escalated, and he does life-saving work. Our cinematographer, I mean, you know, we're, we're confused about this too. The last two weeks have been very difficult. He had a US visa, he tried to board a plane, and, um, and he wasn't able to come. So, we, you know, we're, we're very sad about that. What Orlando von Einsiedel, the director of the film, neglected to mention is that this was not the first time that Raid Saleh, the leader of the White Helmets, failed to appear in the U.S. In April of 2016, Interaction, an alliance of NGOs, held a gala dinner in Washington where it planned to honor Saleh and the work of the White Helmets in Syria. However, Saleh was refused entry into the country when he arrived at Washington's Dulles Airport. Declining to talk about the details of the case, a State Department spokesman merely said, The U.S. government's system of continual vetting means that traveler records are screened against available information in real time. You commend this group, you're going to continue to support them, and yet you revoked the visa of their leader? I don't, that makes zero sense to me. So, uh, a couple responses. One is, uh, unfortunately, we can't speak to uh, individual visa cases. Um, I think broadly speaking, though, uh, on any indivi- on any uh, visa case, uh, uh, we are constantly looking at new information, uh, uh, so-called continually vetting uh, uh, travel or records. Uh, and if we do have new information that we believe 
Uh, this uh, an individual, let me finish, would, would pose a security risk. Uh, we'll certainly act on that. I'm saying that it just strikes me as a bit odd that you're saying that this group is wonderful and does such a great job and you're commending them for their heroism, and yet this you're doing this uh, just 10 days after the leader of this group, who was supposed to be, you know, who got his visa revoked and wasn't allowed to travel here. Well, he's one individual in the group. Um, but the leader of the group. And any, any individual, again, I'm broadening my language here for specific reasons, but any individual in any group uh, suspected of uh, ties or uh, relations with extremist groups uh, or that we had believed to be a security threat to the United States, we would act accordingly. But that does not, by extension, mean we condemn or uh, would cut off ties to the, the group for which that individual works for. So how is this possible? How could the leader of such a valiant team of crusading do-gooders himself be denied a visa to enter the United States as a potential security threat with ties to terrorists? The multi-million dollar PR campaign that surrounds the White Helmets, after all, portrays the group as being pure as the driven snow. This is the call to work for the brave members of the Syrian Civil Defense, an ad hoc grassroots first response unit within rebel-held Syria. Nicknamed the White Helmets, they rush towards the scene of a bombing to save victims, many of whom are trapped under rubble. Once tailors, bakers, pharmacists, these 3,000 ordinary Syrian men and some women, now unwitting heroes. So who are these heroic volunteers? The White Helmets is the unofficial name for the Syrian Civil Defense, a rescue organization made up entirely of volunteers who operate in opposition-controlled Syria. According to their own data, the group have rescued more than 58,000 people, including Omran Daknish, who painfully reminded the world of the horrors unfolding in Syria every day. The task of these modern-day war heroes is extremely dangerous. To date, around 130 White Helmet volunteers have been killed in the country's relentless civil war. One of the group's most notable losses happened in August when an airstrike killed the White Helmet volunteer who miraculously rescued a baby who'd been trapped under rubble for 16 hours. Raed Saleh and Farooq Al Habib are joining us today from in and around Syria. They represent the civil defense forces. What the Syria campaign has come to introduce as the White Helmets. We often heard over the past three and a half years of covering the conflict, who are the good guys in Syria? It's such a mess. They are the good guys. But what is always left out of these glowing mainstream media puff pieces is any actual information about the organization. Where did it come from? Who founded it? Where does it get its funding? And why does it operate exclusively in terrorist-held areas of Syria? The first clues about the real nature of the group comes from their name itself. Calling themselves the Syria Civil Defense is misleading in multiple ways. First, it implies that the group was founded in Syria by Syrians. It was not. The group was in fact founded in March 2013 in Turkey by James Le Mesurier, a former British military intelligence officer then doing contract work for the US and UK governments. None of this information is even controversial. This is the story, as told by Le Mesurier himself, at a conference in Lisbon in 2015. In early 2013, I had a meeting with nine uh, local leaders that had come out from northern Aleppo. And they painted this picture of the frequency and the intensity of the bombing that was taking place. And I was delivering programs on behalf of the US and UK government and we were able to offer them some good governance training, some democratization training, and a handful of sat phones. Several days later, I was very fortunate um, to meet the, uh, the head of Turkey's earthquake response group, uh, a group of people called Akut. And the conversation that we had was along the lines of, if they can rescue people as a result of a building that's been flattened as a result of an earthquake, how possible is it to rescue people from a building that's been collapsed as a result of a bomb? 
And this led to a series of design labs. Um, we brought a number of people out of Syria who brought building samples. Um, and we sat down over several days, merging the expertise of the Syrians that had come out from the ground, who knew the regime tactics, um, with my organization that understood operating in war zones, and the expertise of this organization, Akut, who rescue people after earthquakes. The name Syria Civil Defense is also a lie because there is a real Syria Civil Defense that has been operating in the country for 65 years. The actual Syria Civil Defense, a volunteer search and rescue organization, was established in Syria in 1953. Unlike the White Helmets, the real Syria Civil Defense is a member of the International Civil Defense Organization and, again in contrast to the White Helmets, has an emergency number, 113, that can be called in Syria by those needing assistance. But this Syria civil defense does not enjoy the glitz and glamour of Oscar-winning documentaries, the constant attention of the international press, or the more than $60 million in funding by foreign governments that have been bestowed on the White Helmets. Do you know who finances them, how they operate, who are they supported by, what kind of organization they have? How do you get your information? Well, from um, so well, I can say we, we provide we them with. Well, well, I can tell you that we yeah. provide through USAID about right. twenty-three million dollars in assistance right. uh, to them. But they are fantastically brave. Uh, these white helmets. I'm proud to say we're giving them uh, another, I think, thirty-two million pounds of funding as part of a wider uh, sixty-five million pound package for uh, non-humanitarian aid. Now, I would like to come back to the funding of the White Helmets in a little more detail. Um, my colleague here covered it um, in general. But I would like to focus on the UK Foreign Office and the use of the Conflict Stability and Security Fund to support and finance the Syrian opposition and the White Helmets. The UK regime is a primary player in the US coalition and in its operations inside Syria. Following a recent parliamentary question from Baroness Caroline Cox, it has been confirmed that the UK Foreign Office has financed the Syrian opposition almost £200 million over three years through this conflict fund. However, the British government has so far refused to release the names of the recipients. During my time in East Aleppo in 2016-17 and with Syrian journalist Khaled Iskaif, while searching the, the council office, the local council offices, we found and translated documents in Arabic that referred to two UK organizations, Adam Smith International and Integrity Global. Both organizations are funded by the UK Foreign Office via this conflict fund to offer assistance to the Syrian opposition. And this has been achieved via a variety of outreach agents, one of whom is the Tamkeen Project, which claims to build resilience in Syrian communities and which establishes funds and supports the local councils in terrorist-held areas such as East Aleppo and Idlib. Tamkeen was responsible for the financing and maintenance of the East Aleppo councils. According to Britta Hagi Hassan, self-professed mayor of Aleppo, in an interview with The Guardian, the program provided East Aleppo City Council with £820,000 in May 2016. During my time working in East Aleppo, it was clear that the councils were working hand-in-hand -hand with Nusra Front. Their centres in each district were always next door to Nusra Front headquarters and White Helmet centres, i.e. they always formed an integrated complex. But even more disturbing than the unusual founding or clandestine funding of the group is the mountain of evidence demonstrating that the White Helmets, far from their official claim to political neutrality, are in fact intimately embedded with known and listed terrorist organizations in Syria. Again, the most damning evidence in this regard is not controversial in the slightest. It comes directly from the White Helmets themselves. Numerous videos and photos have surfaced showing the White Helmets parading on the dead bodies of Syrian government forces and flying the flags of known terrorist organizations. An in-depth report on the Syrian war blog last year examined the social media profiles of 65 different White Helmet-connected figures and found numerous posts in support of ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra, Arar al-Sham, and other listed terrorist organizations. Some even posted pictures of themselves with known terrorist leaders or waving the flag of terrorist groups like ISIS 
and many proudly displayed images of dead Syrian soldiers. Most incredible of all is the footage of the White Helmets attending the executions of Syrian civilians and soldiers by terrorist groups, moving in to cart the dead bodies away mere seconds after the victims are brutally slain. Most of this evidence is explained away as bad apples in the organization acting on their own. Some of these bad apples are then castigated in public displays, like when one white helmet was fired when footage surfaced showing him disposing the mutilated corpses of Syrian government fighters. When a graphic video of the white helmets overseeing the execution of a man in terrorist-occupied Dara surfaced last year, the group actually defended the workers while acknowledging that they, quote, did not fully uphold the strict principle of neutrality and impartiality. But incredibly, James Le Missourier, the former British intelligence officer who founded the White Helmets in 2013, defended the workers caught in one bloody video from May 2015. The Middle Ground, a Singaporean website, ran a story last year featuring Le Missourier's take on the incident. But what about the damning video from May 6, 2015? The article reads... White Helmet volunteers were caught on tape running in to clear a body seconds after a gunman executed a man. It turns out that the deceased was tried and sentenced to death in a local Sharia court, said Mr. Missourier. When his father found out about the time of execution, he called the White Helmets to help him conduct a proper burial. Besides, the gunman was clad in a balaclava, not a White Helmet. Accusing the White Helmets of this act would be akin to accusing Joseph of Arimathea of crucifying Jesus. In opposition to the deafening mainstream media silence over this incredible mountain of evidence against the White Helmets, stand only a handful of independent researchers, universally ignored, castigated, or marginalized from the mainstream discussion on the issue. These independent researchers include Vanessa Beely, a British researcher who has been one of the few journalists to report extensively on the ground in areas like East Aleppo over the last two years, and Eva Bartlett, a Canadian blogger who has gained notoriety for using her own on-the-ground reporting from Syria to speak out against the mainstream narrative about the White Helmets. And the majority of the evidence against the White Helmets comes from the White Helmets themselves, from their own videos, their own videos of them participating in the executions of both civilians and Syrian Arab army prisoners of war, for which crimes they are sacked, by the way. You know, none of their sponsors at that point are held accountable for their crimes against the Syrian people and against the Syrian army that is defending the Syrian people and that comes from the Syrian people. So um, Rod Saleh, who's the White Helmets leader, isn't allowed in the U.S. He was denied entry to the U.S. Um, for his questionable ties to extremists. And that, that's actually from the State Department's Mark Toner. Um, and then the White Helmets leader in um, Idlib, uh, Muaya Hassan Aga, um, he, he was somebody that is a rogue element. And he, um, he was uh, apparently involved in an execution, or he was, at, at, um, he was there at an execution of two prisoners of war in Aleppo. And he was supposedly fired from the White Helmets, but then he later reappeared with White Helmets. So um, he's a leader. You know, and so these are not rogue. Again, there's there's um, a number of people that have compiled photos showing over 60 White Helmets members, their social media posts um, with them, either, um, you know, black flags, Al Qaeda flags, ISIS flags, holding weapons or them even in White Helmets uniforms holding weapons and them in uniforms at, you know, Al Qaeda cheering rallies with black flags flying all over the place. So these are clearly not rogue. Given that there are so few voices speaking up against the White Helmets, it should come as no surprise that when The Guardian finally deigned to address what they termed the conspiracy theories about the organization, they turned their attention on these very researchers. In How Syria's White Helmets Became Victims of an Online Propaganda Machine, The Guardian turned to Olivia Solon to dismiss all opposition to the White Helmets as the work of anti-imperialist activists, conspiracy theorists, and trolls with the support of the Russian government. The choice of Solon to report on this story is especially odd. A technology reporter in San Francisco, Solon has no background of any sort in geopolitics or combat zone reporting and, as far as can be determined, has never set foot in Syria. Instead, she relied exclusively on sources such as the murky PR lobbying firm The Syria Campaign, 
to praise the White Helmets and castigate their detractors. Bizarrely, the report devotes a great deal of attention to the White Helmets' mannequin challenge video, footage of an admittedly fake and staged rescue operation released by the group in an attempt to cash in on a viral internet video trend taking place at the time. The inference of the video is obvious, that the group is perfectly capable of staging incredibly realistic and completely fake rescue operations at any time. These fake videos, stripped of their context, would be uncritically promoted as authentic by mainstream outlets like The Guardian in the exact same way that the completely fictitious video of a Syrian boy rescuing his sister under sniper fire was uncritically accepted by the mainstream media until it was admitted to be a fake video produced in Malta by a Norwegian film crew to, quote, see how the media would respond to such a video. The Guardian's headline when the fake Norwegian film production was released? Syrian boy saves girl from army sniper video. Strangely, Solon's report does not mention that incident. The majority of The Guardian's report focuses on why the innocent and virtuous White Helmets would be so viciously attacked by independent journalists and how all opposition to the group is connected to the Kremlin. This is supposedly demonstrated in an utterly meaningless infographic of colored dots showing precisely nothing of substance. Unsurprisingly, Solon's contact with the reporters whose work she was set to impugn displayed her biases from the very start. In early October, I received an email. I don't think I noticed it right away, but anyway, when I did, essentially, it was an email from this Olivia Salon um, who contributes to The Guardian and is based in um, um, San Francisco, California, saying that she'd love to interview me for a story she was doing um, imminently. Um, and as I said, I didn't see the email right away, so she sent another email within the next day or so again, asking some questions about, you know, my stance on the white helmets, if I believe they were, um, you know, actors, I, I can pull up the exact email, and I think you've seen a, a, a rebuttal I did on global research, which actually includes screenshots of our conversation. Anyway, um, the, the questions she posed to me um, indicated that she didn't have an honest intent in investigating the white helmets. Um, and in fact, you know, given that she contributes to The Guardian, albeit from California, um, not from Syria, uh, but The Guardian itself has constantly, um, consistently, I should say, spewed war propaganda on Syria. Um, you know, just that factor alone would make one pause and think, like, what's the objective of this article? But then the questions, um, have I received any gifts from Assad or from Syria and Russia or North Korea? She noticed with interest that I had been to North Korea recently. How is it possible to go to Syria and North Korea, given that they're both so darn controlled? You know, and when I get those kind of claims, I refer back to a blog post I, I very quickly like typed out um, last year or so. Those of us who report accurately in Syria, something like that, are Russian propagandists. Anyway, this is a segue, but the whole point being, um, anybody can apply for a visa at the Syrian embassy in Beirut. You do have to wait a while. I've had to wait over a month on many occasions. And you pay a fee and then you go to Syria. You, you arrange your transportations. And in fact, had I been reporting for The Guardian, probably I would assume that all my expenses and all that would have been taken care of by that institution, that corporate institution. Anyway, so her questions um, were very leading. She had a predetermined story, as she called it. And I wonder, you know, as another aside, if her use of the word story was to kind of um, take away from the fact that she wasn't actually going to insert any truth in it, it was just a story. Uh, and so basically after seeing her questions, I just replied to her something like, I'm not interested in participating in your already predetermined script. You know, my colleague uh, Vanessa Beely received a, a similar email around the same time um, with similar questions, some slightly catered to Vanessa's own background. Um, and she did reply more in depth. Oh, well, I mean, Olivia Solon contacted myself and Ava Bartlett pretty much at the same time. And she sent a list um, from memory of about 20 questions, all of which were basically asking myself and Ava to defend um, our position and the evidence that we'd uh, collated over, a, you know, a couple of years. For me, certainly three years or now four years investigating the White Helmet organization. Um, both um, remotely and inside Syria on the ground. 
um, so it was it was very much an attempt to put us in a position of having to defend ourselves. And I think both of us quite rightly took the position that look, we're not here to defend ourselves. You should be defending the evidence against this organization instead of providing a blanket promotional um, report on this organization, which is what The Guardian has specifically done, of course. Um, since the creation of this organization. You know, in 2016, it lobbied effectively for the White Helmets to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And when it was inundated with negative comments, it simply closed comments. So, you know, The Guardian, which itself is embedded um, in the corporate neocolonialist um, structure in the UK, I mean, it's it's owned um, by Scott Trust Limited. It gets the majority of it's uh, ad revenue from HSBC that is not only the Swiss banking part of HSBC that has been um, basically uh, prosecuted for fraud, but also has been also found guilty um, of fraud against um, consumers in the UK. So, you know, this is already a sort of an interesting background to The Guardian. Um, and hardly surprising then, of course, that they're supporting the the sort of humanitarian, in inverted commas, war concept that is always the driver behind particularly UK foreign office um, policy in the region. Um, so Solon approached us with these questions. We both went back and basically said we have no interest in defending ourselves. And then, of course, she went out to um, fundamentally all of those entities, organizations and individuals who support fund, finance, and do the PR for the White Helmets, such as the Syria campaign, which incidentally, two days later, produced a 46-page report in which, again, I'm described as the queen of disinformation. And even in that 46 pages, they do not address one element of the evidence against the White Helmets. Researchers like B. Lee Bartlett and Professor Tim Anderson, also mentioned in Solon's report, are easy enough targets for The Guardian. Independent journalists taking it upon themselves to counter the Syria narrative, they would never be taken seriously by establishment media circles in the first place. Curiously omitted from the Guardian article, however, are the award-winning, internationally respected journalists who have similarly expressed skepticism about the White Helmets, their backers, and the PR campaign that surrounds them. There is Gareth Porter, the award-winning journalist who has contributed to foreign policy, foreign affairs, The Nation, Al Jazeera, Salon, the Huffington Post, Alternate, and countless other outlets, who wrote How a Syrian White Helmet's Leader Played Western Media in November 2016. There is Philip Giraldi, a former CIA counterterrorism specialist and military intelligence officer who wrote The Fraud of the White Helmets in July of 2017. There is Stephen Kinzer, former New York Times correspondent and, ironically, current contributor to The Guardian, who tweeted his congratulations to Al-Qaeda and Syrian jihadists, when the film about their PR outfit, The White Helmets, won the Oscar. And, of course, there is John Pilger, one of the most respected and celebrated journalists and documentarians of the past half century. In Syria, they know how to intervene. They know how to manipulate the media. We had the White Helmets, a complete propaganda construct in Syria. They end up getting an Academy Award. They know how to intervene in, in public discourse every day and in politics every day. It is unclear whether Solon and The Guardian believe Porter, Giraldi, Kinzer, and Pilger to be anti-imperialist activists, conspiracy theorists, or trolls with the support of the Russian government. But the issue here is not merely one of PR and propaganda as appalling as the uncritical reporting about the White Helmets has been. What is worrying is that the so-called Syrian civil defense is, as we have seen, not Syrian at all. Founded, funded, and promoted by foreign governments, foreign contractors, and foreign lobbyists and PR agencies, the White Helmets are not a spontaneous Syrian search and rescue operation, but a template. A template that, if successful, can and will be employed anywhere and everywhere that those same foreign powers want to destabilize targeted governments in the future. But I think what is interesting, why is this organization being protected to such an extent? I think it's because 
um, the imperialist apparatus is defending the concept. We've already seen James Le Mesurier recruiting in Brazil. We know that the White Helmets have appeared um, in Malaysia and in Venezuela and in the Philippines. So, you know, because this went through my head so many times, these are only 3,000 really criminals and thugs that have sort of emerged from the terrorist ranks or the free Syrian army moderate extremist ranks to become the White Helmets in order to get paid to continue doing the same job, but under a different auspice. Why are they being so heavily protected? But but I think it's more to do with the concept. It's more to do with the importance of this concept going forward. As James Le, Le Missourier said very recently, who would you trust more than the fire brigade or a first response NGO? You know, there you have it. That's the key to why this group is so important. In the end, the point is no more that we should uncritically accept every statement made in opposition to the White Helmets than that we should uncritically accept every statement made in their favor. The point is that in a world where people were concerned about the real truth of the matter, we would not be forced to rely on the on-the-ground reports of Beely, Bartlett, and the handful of other independent journalists who actually bother to visit Syria and talk to actual Syrians about what is happening in their country. In such a world, there would be many different journalists, researchers, and citizens, all trying to get to the bottom of what was really happening in the country. But we do not live in such a world, and one thing is perfectly clear. We cannot rely on outlets like The Guardian and their fellow travelers like BBC News, Channel 4, CNN, and other mainstream establishment outlets to report the truth on these matters. So I wasn't really aware of Olivia Salon prior to her having contacted me, so I wasn't following her on Twitter. However, um, after the article came out, I realized I found that first her um, Twitter account was closed to comments, and then it was opened, but people like myself were blocked from commenting. And um, she was uh, seemingly outraged at one point that you know we went ahead and, and made our own statements and rebuttals without having the courtesy of sending her an email even though we were the subject of her smear piece. Uh, and um, the other thing is, yeah, the Guardian comment section is closed, except on social media. Um, I'm not, you know, I don't look at the Guardian that much, um, except when I want to prove how they're lying. So I'm not aware of if that's been their policy for a while, if that's a new thing. Um, I do notice that um, at the bottom of many of their articles, there's a plea for donations for honest investigative journalism. And I say, yes, definitely support honest investigative journalism, but you won't find it on the Guardian. Olivia Solon was contacted for comment on this report, but she did not respond to the request. And the Oscar goes to the White Helmets. The Corbett Report is brought to you by the Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support. I'm so sorry. I can't hold back and I won't. A lot of babies don't make it. That was the miracle baby. I just can't believe that I can't hold it together when I watch that video. And Farouk and Raid can be here to tell us about it. And they, 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 they are stronger than us. They are just stronger than us. <laughs> 